Hey beloved, welcome to this vlog. And of course, again, I cannot say it often enough, but I will refrain from that and I will use restraint as an aspect of the, uh, the fruit of Holy Spirit to say, I'm so glad to be with you and to be able to share God's word with you and together we will learn and grow in the realization of our God and his Christ. That is what it's all about in this life before the resurrection. So let's continue our study about the path towards glory and the fact that it is much better that glory after suffering. How does God do that? He transforms, he converts suffering into glory. Let's take a look. Let's continue. So we already saw this slide and we saw that, um, that suffering must be converted into glory, right? You can see that. So we already read this slide and we already concluded that suffering had to be done. So it had to be literal. It was binding. The pain needed to be felt. There was no escape possible. So it is a universal principle. So important to, 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 get, to grab that. So let's continue. So it is God who transforms suffering into glory. Be aware of that. The suffering is, as Romans 8, 17 says, it is glorified. The Greek word is sundoxastomen. Sundoxastomen meaning together plus see make. Together plus see make. Or see mice or st mice or glorify together. So the suffering is glorified. Not we are glorifying suffering. Listen carefully. But the suffering is transformed into glory. That's the point. That's the point. So Romans 8, 17, 18. Let's read it. Yet if children and joyous also of an allotment and joyous indeed of an allotment from God yet joined and joyous of Christ's allotment if so be that we are suffering together that we should be glorified together also you see that that combination that ratio right for I am reckoning that the sufferings of the current era do not deserve the glory about to be revealed for us. This is an eloquent um, use of words here. But please remember, suffering and glory go together as such, but then the sentence is followed by the ratio between suffering and glory. And the ratio is stupendously large. We're talking um, minus one for suffering and plus a trillion for glory. You see the point. So this is unbelievable. We cannot fathom what will happen to us in terms of glory. The weight of glory that we will uh, receive. The finest example of such glorification we see in Christ himself, obviously. In his body of glory, suffering is over, of course. That body no longer has any wounds, but it still clearly shows the signs that remind of his crucifixion. Look at John 20, 27. But remember before we continue, this is only because he wants it to be. It's according to God's plan that the signs on his body are still showing. Because if he didn't want that, 
there would be no sign of suffering whatsoever. But they are showing as a remembrance, as a reminder, just according to plan. That's my viewpoint I'm sharing with you here. Of course, because a glorified body is a totally different body, obviously. So when John describes the lamp in the book of Revelation, he sees it how? He sees it standing, the lamp standing. That means the lamp is risen as having been slain. Standing as having been slain. That means he is risen. He was slain, but he is risen. He has been roused. The slaughter is glorified. The slaughter is converted into glory. You see the point in, in his resurrection. And his resurrection is what it is all about. Without the resurrection, we would still be in our sins. Did you know that? Read 1 Corinthians 15. You will see. So it's very important to realize and to be aware of the fact that the suffering will be converted into glory. It has become his ultimate glory. The slaughter has become his ultimate glory because of the contrast. The contrast that is shown in that sense. So in his victory, the previous battle on the cross takes on its meaning. I repeat, in Christ's victory, his previous battle takes on its meaning. Now you see why it was necessary. Okay. Let's continue. John 20, 27 through 29. Thereafter, he is saying to Thomas, Bring your finger here and perceive my hands and bring your hand and thrust it into my sight and do not become unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now Jesus is saying to him, Seeing that you have seen me with your eyes, you have believed. But happy are those who are not perceiving and believe. I uh, already twice I recommended you and myself also to ponder on these things. Remember? Because we are not perceiving deadly squat. We see nothing. We see nothing. So this is about faith. If we think about these things, our faith will be further fueled. And we will see in spirit. Just like Moses saw in spirit. He saw the riches of Christ as such in spirit and he looked away to the reward and he looked away from the richness so-called of Egypt so it's about faith let's continue <clears throat> Adam and Eve they had no knowledge of good in the Garden of Eden we realize that don't we they had no knowledge of good before eating that fruit although they were they were very well off in the garden they didn't know it it was paradise but they didn't know it they weren't aware of it so they didn't appreciate it no smile on their face at all ever only through evil would they come to know good only through evil would Adam and Eve come to know good. No meaning aware of good. Feel the, the, the pleasure of good. You can only do that and experience that when you have experienced evil also. They ate the forbidden fruit, which meant 
they they no longer had access to the tree of life and they and their descendants were doomed to death but it was precisely in that way that they came to know and experience the good so important this principle of contrast without this misery man would never have known what compassion is and what mercy is and what grace and love are mankind would never know that remember but when the evil has done its job in god's plan it will be discarded it will not be necessary anymore why because it's not about the evil ultimately but it's about the knowledge of evil that enhances the knowledge of good you see the point so this is so this principle is so essential in god's plan all right without sin there would never have been anything to forgive and to grant grace about it wouldn't be necessary and one would therefore never have been able to fathom the depth of god's love how about that it wouldn't be able so only through sickness would one learn to value health and it is precisely through sorrow that we learn to appreciate joy the universal principle is that we come to know the good through contrast i.e through knowledge of its opposite we know good only through knowledge of its opposite and then we can value good so the future glory will not be a restoration of what it once was it is not a return to sins of course not in that case the suffering would have been in vain yes that's unthinkable for a good god to bring suffering in the lives of his creatures in order to go back to the normal good the return to sins no 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 the difference is endlessly bigger god who is good wouldn't have allowed evil to have a place in his plan if it were not necessary suffering serves as a, bra- a backdrop to glory even as a jeweler takes a dark background to make a diamond shine remember that god doesn't make a mistake never impossible ephesians 3 verse 16 that he that's god may be giving you in accord with the riches of his glory to me to be made staunch with power through his spirit in the man within so let me see if i wrote this down i don't see it here i don't remember but i will just reiterate this he may be giving us to be made staunch with power through his spirit not out of the riches of his glory he doesn't give us out of his riches he gives us in accord with the riches of his glory that is a totally different measure that is stupendously large because he gives in accord with the riches of his glory 
Huh. Think about it. Let's ponder on this. Already in the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul wrote about the riches of the glory of the enjoyment of his allotment among the saints. Remember, that is the glory that God has intended for us. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, Paul didn't have to pray for that because already was known that God has intended the glory for us, the glory that was mentioned in the first chapter. After all, that is our guaranteed property already in spirit now, right now as we speak. But let's continue. <laughs> Ephesians 1.18, let's, let's read that first. The eyes of your heart having been enlightened for you to perceive what is the expectation of his calling and what the riches of the glory of the enjoyment of his allot allotment among the saints are, you could say. Paul's prayer is about what God would do in us with this. It is one thing to have the riches of his glory but if it stays like that just like that then it's only that capital it isn't used that's the point so then I'm like an ignorant multimillionaire who spends his life in poverty because I'm not even aware of the riches that uh, are mine that's really, it's really sad. It's a shame, of course. It's a waste. And you know what waste is, right? Sin is waste also. And it's definitely a waste. Literally and figuratively. What matters, namely, is that we realize, again, that we realize what the riches of his glory are. And the level to which we know that wealth is proportional to the power we will experience in our lives. Colossians 1.11 Again, the level to which we know that wealth is proportional to the power that we will experience in our lives right now as we speak. Not Pentecostal experience, no. Spiritual experience by knowing by realizing, by being aware of power in the inner man that is not in the stomach but in the heart power that makes us strong and vital that starts with knowledge and awareness let's go one more Colossians uh, 1 verse 10 and 11 it's about the riches of his glory right you to walk worthily of the Lord for all pleasing bearing fruit in every good work and growing growing as we go in the realization of God being endued with all power in accord with the might of his glory for all endurance and patience with joy wow and we're talking this is our current life before glorification this term is also the, the name of my channel and my let's say organization uh, revago is the dutch equivalent of realization of god so this is an important passage for me personal as well of course so the the purpose is to grow in the realization of god and his will but also the realization of god and his christ who is christ really mm -hmm. so it's about all endurance and patience with joy how 
how do we go through endurance and patience with joy by being endued with all power in accord with the might of his glory in accord with the might of his glory and that can only be done through the realization of God who he really is and growing in that realization besides the great exhortation in this passage we clearly see that it's the realization that makes the coin drop it's through the realization that it becomes alive in us so to speak so that the power of these riches actually works in our life right now spiritually speaking so we will end this video here thanks for watching and ponder on it see you next time bye bye